said, that's basically, that's how we met. You know, Scott worked for the Franklin Men's Shelter, and me and BDP Posse was in there, bugging, running around Ellen, you know, so, but. Well, um, regardless where you from, you know, it's where you at. You know, like if, if people can't, if people, you know, use a crutch as far as, you know, they ain't got this or they ain't got that, you know, that's, everything else is material, you know what I'm saying? As long as they got their physical form and their mind, whatever they want to happen can happen, you know, and I express that too. The Concrete Jungle, Long Island, New York, the Bronx. We planned our goals. We knew exactly what it is we wanted to do, where it is we wanted to go. Two of the greatest MCs that ever blessed the mic. Rock him a law. Meets the blast master, the teacher, KRS One. In his mini documentary series, The Rock Kim and KRS One Era. William Michael Griffin, born January 28th, 1968, in Long Island, New York. Rakim was birthed by the parents of Willie Griffin and Cynthia Griffin. William Michael Griffin, better known by his stage name, Rakim. Rakim means sun god from the land of the burnt faced people. Ra means sun god. Kim is another word for Egypt. You know, and it's, it means the land of the brown face people. I think it's very important for a rapper to pick out his name because it identifies who he is, what he represents, what he stands for. It's a big part of the image. Artist at that time was original. The whole point to be in hip hop was to be yourself, your brand. You don't want your name sounding like nobody else. You don't want your rhyme sounding like nobody else. You don't want, want to look like nobody else. And that's why they call it the golden years of hip hop. You I'm want out. the wild factor in your name, but yet it's easy to understand. You know, uh, y y your name or your brand is everything. So be careful with the name that you choose because it might last with you forever. So if you choose a corny name and run with it for five albums, guess what? We still gonna be calling you that the next five albums as you grow up. He also has a slew of siblings that is all musically inclined. Allegedly, rumors have it, Rakim is the nephew of the late American R&B singer and actress Ruth Brown. Who is Ruth Brown, you may ask? Ruth Austin Brown was an American singer, songwriter, and actress, sometimes referred to as the queen of R&B. Ruth Brown has won many accolades, also have been awarded Grammys a numerous of times, and actually won a couple. But they say what took her over the top is when she added pop music to R&B. A lot of music and artists, when they first created a record, um, their, their goal for it sometimes changes. And, it, right. and, and, and people put them in categories that they wasn't even uh, wanted to be in that category. Or white, white, uh, America radio stations choose to say, hey, that's good enough for us to listen to. We approve of it. So yeah, that's a good record. Um, and that's when they say you, you crossed over. You, <laughs> you, you crossed over because now the masses really like you. Most R&B artists or rap artists don't plan to go commercial. It depends on the label if they want to push you that far. Because really the rapper don't have no control. Understand what I'm saying? It depends on 
label, see it feasible for the investment to place you into that space of pop culture. seven years old. As young Rakim was growing up, he was inspired to play football. He watched all the greats on TV and he said to himself, I could be one of the greats too. But he didn't know he would be one of the greats in another category. What I do when I'm writing, I'm putting down my life, you know what I'm saying? And you know, I don't believe in writer's block, so when I get to the point where, you know, I'm getting slow on the ink, I just put the pen down, then I go back out in the world and live. So, you know, I'm constantly, I'm not rhyming, I'm just thinking, you know what I'm saying? So when I get back to the paper, I got more life to put down. Rapper is more or less somebody who becomes, well, not everyone, but they try to become good at the art form of lyricism. And that can lead to really good studio albums and things of that nature. Um, but an MC is someone who is next to originally the DJ. So the MC, that those two letters, master of ceremony. This is the person who would keep the party rocking, keep it going. Shout out the dope DJ, shout out people in the party and created little chants and stuff to go with the break beats of the DJ in order to keep the party going. So an MC is someone who eventually became very good at lyrics, but also live on stage in front of a crowd, but is also a very good presenter of the lyricism and can control the crowd with the ebbs and the flows of the music or even freestyling, all kind of stuff like that. And it's very now, at least, you know, an MC like Busy B is not the most lyrical dude in the history of rap. So if people want to make MC strictly about being super dope on the lyrics, that's not really it at all. An MC is someone who, with the ability of rap, can really rock a crowd and can control the scene, acapella or even on the beat. That's really the difference between the two to me. A rapper. Most likely, in my mind, a rapper got lyrics. Like a rapper could just straight up rap, just nonstop to any beat. Um, you know, relentless, always gonna, you know, always got a rhyme for you. That's a rapper. Uh, MC is someone who entertains. In my book, um, it's an entertainer. They still can rap, but they could do a little bit more than just rap. They can uh, make a crowd be involved with the actual performance. As time went on, Rakim got interested in different things, such as writing poetry. Before his name was Rakim Allah, his name was Kid Wizard. Rakim was introduced to the Nation of Islam in 1986. He later joined the Nation of Gods and Earths, also known as the 5% Nation. And that's where he adopted his name, Rakim Allah. Rakim was introduced to DJ Eric B through a mutual friend. He started writing rhymes to fit Eric B's instrumentals. And he perfected it. He mastered it. Rakim came with a slow flow very crisp and precise. DJ Eric B was in search for New York's top MC. And Rakim responded. The first track they recorded was Check Out My Melody. And from that point on, it was history. And they became the duo, Eric B and Rakim. The first song that caught me to rock him. Uh, check out my melody. Check out my melody. That is the God. That joint. 
And um, when I first heard that, it was the whistle of the song. And hearing Rakim go on top of that whistle. You know, and riding that beat to the pocket. I never heard that before because rhymes before that was kind of like one, two raps. More like Melly Mel, even with Run DMC, kind of choppy raps. But Rakim made it flow like water. Song that uh, caught my attention, um, Rock him is uh, the ghetto. Uh, why you feel that was personal? Uh, because it, it spoke about what was going on. I can identify with the things he was saying that I was going through, and you know how he expressed it, it was like, yeah, you know, I live that. I know exactly what you're talking about. You know what I'm saying, and, and that so. You know, that had an impact on me, you know. Let me take my glasses. <laughs> me and Eric B was cooling at the Palladium. Seen an all-world cover girl. I said, hey, lady of Saturday, if you're in the rush, don't let me hold you up or intervene or interrupt. But mahogany. It's been a long time. I shouldn't have left you without a strong mind to step to. Lawrence Chris Parker, born August 20th, 1965. Better known by stage name, KRS One. Knowledge reigns supreme over nearly everyone. Chris Parker was born in New York City, the borough of Brooklyn, in 1965 to an American mother. His biological father wasn't involved in his early years. His biological father is actually from the Caribbean islands of Barbados. As Chris was growing up, him and his stepfather didn't get along too much. His mother decided to leave the marriage and take his younger brother Kenny and Chris and move to the Bronx. Even in the Bronx, home life was still dysfunctional for Chris. He couldn't take it no more. At age 13, he left home permanently and spent time living homeless in the city of New York. Eventually, he checked himself into a group home in the Bronx. Our shelters are usually, you know, they're there because of the bottle, the crack, the, the needle, the whatever it is, they're there for a reason. We were there simply because we, no one else would believe in us, family-wise. No one believed in our music. No one would ever dream. You know, you tell somebody, tell your mother you want to make a rap record. She's, oh, no, you're bugging. You know, get your butt in school and, you know, so on. So, you know, I, I, I left home at a very young age. As the young lad was growing up, Chris embraced hip hop, was still kind of new on the scene. He became a graffiti writer and was good at it. And at that time, also, he was mastering his craft to be an MC. During his hiatus at the shelter, he met someone, a youth counselor, Scott Sterling, AKA DJ Scott LaRock. They had a lot of things in common in music and the love for hip hop. And they merged together to be the DJ and the MC duo. As Chris was still doing his graffiti writing in the streets, he came up with the name KRS One. Knowledge reigned supreme over nearly everyone. Together, him and Scott LaRock created Boogie Down Productions releasing their debut album, Criminal Minded. Karis One had a rival MC, and his name was MC Shan. MC Shan had a song called The Bridge, representing where he's from in Queensbridge. Karis One counterattacked it with the song called The South Bronx. Then Karis One came with the finishing blow. The bridge is over. 
of that skyrocket his career to legendary status. As Scott LaRock and Karis One fame exploded and the whole Boogie Down production crew, tragedy happened. Scott LaRock was fatally gunned down in the Bronx. He was shot in the head in the midst of breaking up a fight. I feel, it, in a way, us as a group, we don't mourn. We had our chance for mourning. You know, you have that one day, you cry it out, and then that's it. You know, we don't mourn and keep going and keep going and keep going. And you, you know, you celebrate, if anything, you know, because we're, we're advancing constantly, you know what I mean? If we had flopped, then I would be sad that Scott's gone and we're hot. my career went down the drain and this and that. His son will, will live what he doesn't have materially, so everything's straight. So, um, song with Karis one that caught my attention. There's so many of them because Karis one is, you know, he's the teacher, you know. So a lot of things that he said, you know, my philosophy was one of them. Um, he made me think like, okay, wait, hold up. I'm learning this stuff in history class. This man is saying something totally about history that's making me think like, well, you know what I'm saying? Y'all teaching me so. Y'all teaching the wrong thing to me. You know what I'm saying? Especially back then. Especially back then. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. It's a move. Blossom, something, you got to prove a new era. Karis one comes better. Something, never, cause I'm too clever. However, I own my own label. Partners with Scott LaRock, key on the turntables. That was hard. Similar, what are some similarities between Chris and Ra? I think the idea of being black men with knowledge and, 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 and using your talent to try to speak some degrees of knowledge and thought to your people is something that both of them guys had in common. But the differences between the two artists, I believe Rakim wasn't necessarily more lyrical, but he just had a consistent vein that he stayed in, which influenced a lot of rappers who did become popular much later. Chris tried all different kinds of styles. He would throw reggae in his stuff, things of that nature. So I really think that the biggest difference between them is that Chris styled himself as the philosopher, the teacher of hip hop, and Rakim was really just being a smooth lyricist, bro. I see their legacy as the same as it is now, and it's, it's etched in stone. You got it. There's a whole new generation that never heard of Rakim. I never heard of Karis One, but you know, like with this documentary, they will hear, and they're gonna go back just to see if we tell them the truth. So they're gonna go back. You know, they're gonna go back and listen to those styles and that music and say, hmm, these, these dudes was dope. Oh, they timeless. You know, they, they in the Hip Hop Hall of Fame. You know, it's still, you know, relevant to today's culture. You know what I mean? They are the hip hop culture. You know, they the fathers of. Where do I see Rock Him and Karis One Legacy 50 years from now? I think we will see it the same way, the hip hop culture, how we look at James Brown. Um, like I said, Chuck Berry, all of the greats, Michael Jackson. They like the Michael Jackson, you know, of uh, hip hop. I think at the time in the 80s, hip hop was new and um, they didn't have the budget to take them to that next level because hip hop was so new, you know, the investment in that genre of music very low. 
But now you're seeing kids and they going triple platinum and all this and that and the third because hip hop is very popular now. As that time, hip hop was strictly for the urban. And then once it started getting out to the suburban, that's when the investments and all that other stuff came in. 